<laughs> no, thanks. Nice, nice catch. <laughs> well, I'd like, like to thank everyone for uh, coming here to listen to Rachel's uh, thesis defense. It's the end of a journey, let's say, beginning of a new one. And uh, anyway, thanks for coming. And I'll just without ado, I'll turn it over to Rachel to talk about her thesis on a revision of Southwestern Indian Ocean uh, guitar fishes, genus Rhinobatus. Rachel. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all for. <laughs> 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 all right, all right, all right. <laughs> thank you all for joining. Uh, whether you're here in person or virtually on Zoom or YouTube, thank you. Um, and without further ado, we will jump into my thesis. Oh, okay. We're trying different light levels. Moody, uh, Ooh, moody. Fancy. Okay. All right. So, first things first, what is a guitar fish? Besides being a musician's favorite fish, guitar fishes are a family in the order Rhinopristiformes, which are known as the shovel nose rays. They're relatives of sharks, and since they are similar in size and appearance to sharks, they're also sometimes referred to as the shark rays. This order currently contains five families, the sawfishes, the wedgefishes, the giant guitar fishes, the banjo rays, and the guitar fishes. And they can be found all over the world in the tropical and subtropical waters of the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. And these are some of the most threatened with extinction species of cartilaginous fishes. One of the biggest reasons these species are threatened with extinction is because they're a super important component in fisheries catches and are often targeted for their, both their meat, which is often consumed locally, and for their fins, which are considered a lucrative shark and ray product. So the figure on the, I have a laser pointer. This figure on the left shows some rhinobatus that has been sold whole and salted while drying at a fish market in the United Arab Emirates. And the figure on the right, this map here, shows the decrease in fisheries landings for the rhinopristiformes for various locations in the northern Indian Ocean. And generally, landings, or catches for my non-fisheries people, have decreased by over 60% in the last 25 years. And unfortunately, we don't have great data on this um, for other parts of the world, including you know, the east coast of Africa, but there are likely similar patterns. In addition, similar to other cartilaginous fishes, they're also generally characterized by a life history of slow growth, late maturity, and low fecundity or reproductive potential. So it takes them a while to grow. They don't reach sexual maturity until a later age. And once they are big enough and old enough to reproduce, they usually have small litters. So the figure on the right, this graph here, shows maternal total length compared to litter size for the large toothed sawfish, Pristis pristis. They don't reach reproductive age until they're about three meters long, which is about eight to 10 years old. And their litter size generally maxes out at about 11 pups. Currently, researchers also think that sawfishes only give birth once every other year. So we have, again, somewhat limited, limited information on this for all the rhinopristiformes, but there's likely similar trends for the other species in this order. Given these extinction risk factors, there are some conservation and management strategies in place for the rhinopristiformes. However, taxonomic issues such as misidentifications and unidentified species have compounded conservation efforts. Species in this order can be very difficult to distinguish from one another due to high morphological similarity. For example, here are four species of wedgefish, and um, they pretty much all look the same. <laughs> And you can imagine that if you're at a fish market and you have only the fins of a specimen or one that's a bit worse for wear, it would be very difficult for you to confidently ID which species you have. This can lead to all kinds of issues in fishery statistics, including how many individuals of which species were caught. Any undescribed species are also likely to go unreported or misreported in fishery statistics which can make them difficult to trust when making management decisions. As a result, there have been several taxonomic changes to the rhinopristiformes over the last two decades to try and address some of these issues. The largest family, the rhinobatidae, or the guitar fishes in particular, has undergone pretty extensive taxonomic changes over the last decade. Previously, 
This family contained about 50 species across seven genera and was more or less the kitchen sink for the rhinocristiformes. After a revision in 2016, based on morphology, biogeography, and molecular evidence, Rhinobatidae now contains 37 species across three genera, the Acroteriobatus, the Pseudobatus, and the Rhinobatus. Earlier I mentioned that the Rhinopristiformes is one of the most threatened orders of cartilaginous fishes, and within the Rhinobatidae, over 60% of these 37 species are assessed as vulnerable or higher, while the remaining species are assessed as near threatened or lower, or are data deficient. There's a lot that goes into these assessments, but being assessed as vulnerable by the IUCN is kind of this sound the alarm state, where it's like, hey, if we do nothing, the species is probably going to go extinct, so we should do something. And this risk of, or probability of extinction increases as you go from vulnerable to endangered, endangered to critically endangered, which is why extinct in the wild comes after critically endangered. So if we look at the largest genus, Rhinobatus, which currently contains 18 species, we see a similar breakdown of extinction risk in this genus with, all, with 12 species assessed as vulnerable or higher, three assessed as near threatened or lower, and the remaining three assessed as data deficient. You've now seen data deficient show up a few times. What does that mean? This is the full definition of data deficient from the IUCN. In short, it means that we do not know enough information about a species abundance or distribution to evaluate its extinction risk. It also means we cannot implement any kind of management strategy because you can't manage something properly if you don't know the right information about it. So it's kind of a category you do not want a species to be in. And you know, an overarching goal is for no species to be assessed as data deficient. And interestingly, all three data deficient species of rhinobatus are found in the same geographic area, the southwestern Indian Ocean. So along the coasts of South Africa, Mozambique, Tanzania, Kenya, Madagascar, and along the Mascarene Ridge or Plateau, which I'll just highlight Whoa, is this over here. These three species are Austin's guitarfish, Rhinobatus austini, described in 2017. The slender guitarfish, Rhinobatus hulkerhynchus, described in 1922. And the bareback guitarfish, Rhinobatus neuter dorsalis, described in 2004. One of the main reasons these species are data deficient is because they're often mistaken for one another. And as you can probably tell from these photos, they all look pretty similar. And you might be thinking, well, there were those beautiful illustrations of the wedgefish that tried to highlight the differences between them. Isn't there something like this for these species? The short answer is no. And the long answer is because Hulkerinchus was described in 1922, so also happy 100th Earth Day to Hulkerinchus, the original description is quite brief by contemporary standards. Um, that's the whole thing on the right there. That's it. Um, and it doesn't really quantify any morphological characters. And it doesn't describe a majority of the features used to distinguish guitar fishes today. So as a result, both Austini and Neuter dorsalis have been misidentified as Hulkerinchus prior to their descriptions. So just to provide some examples of how this vague original description impacted the identification of the two other species before they were described, on the right is a map of Hulkerinchus reports. And this point out here on the Mascarene Ridge is a neuter dorsalis that was misidentified as Hulkerinchus before neuter dorsalis was described. Similarly, Austini and Hulkerinchus co-occur off the coast of Eastern Africa. And before the description of Austini, any rhinobatus caught here were identified as Hulkerinchus. What also doesn't help is both of these species have a black blotch on the underside of their snout. So that was thought to be unique to Hulkerinchus. It's not, both of them have it. And this has led to some uncertainty about the validity of these species as well as our ability to identify them. So this uncertainty has prevented a lot of research on these organisms leading to their data deficient status. So the description of Hulkerinchus is pretty bare bones. What about the descriptions for Neuter dorsalis and Austini? 
The description of Nuna dorsalis is at least complete by modern standards and describes pretty much all of the features used to describe guitar fishes today. However, it was based on a single male specimen. So although it is thorough, it doesn't cover the range of sizes or features that may exist for this species. And the description of Austini is also complete by modern standards and was written based on multiple individuals. However, all of those individuals were female. So any variations that may be due to sexual dimorphism, which is distinct differences in size or appearance between sexes, were not captured in this description. Since the descriptions of these species, additional specimens of Austini and Neuter dorsalis have become available, including a male Austini and a female Neuter dorsalis. Thus, a redescription of each species was required to clarify their taxonomic status and enhance species-specific identifications. These redescriptions would lay the foundation for future life history, habitat, and population studies, potentially allowing these species to be reassessed by the IUCN in the next set of red list assessments. So my thesis aims to confirm that these three species of rhinobatus are distinct using multivariate statistical analyses, as well as traditional morphological analysis, while exploring which morphological characters are the most useful in distinguishing these species. So how does one do all of that? Before we get into more detail than you ever thought you would about guitar fish morphology, here's just a general guide um, with the dorsal view on the left and the ventral view on the right with a few features labeled. morphological measurements used to distinguish guitar fish species, which can be broken down into three broad groups. Characters related to body size, the oral nasal region, and fin morphology. These measurements were all taken to the nearest millimeter on a total of 13 individuals of Austini, Fulcarincus, and Neuter dorsalis from museum collections. For each species, I had at least three individuals and at least one individual of each sex was measured. I also wanted to clarify that from here on out, the abbreviation SWIO stands for Southwestern Indian Ocean. So if I say SWIO, that is what I refer to because Southwestern Indian Ocean just gets a little repetitive after a while. So if I say SWIO rhinobatus, I'm referring to these three species. So since I was looking at three data deficient species whose taxonomic statuses were unclear, I also looked at the same morphometric data from 25 individuals from four congener species of rhinobatus from the Northern Indian Ocean. And a congener just means species from the same genus. And the four chosen species were rhinobatus anandalii, lionotus, punctifer, and rangensis. These species were chosen because were chosen since the descriptions of Anandalii, Lionotus, and Punctifer were re all recently revised in 2019 with the description of Rhinobatus rangensis. In addition, all four of these species have been assessed by the IUCN, which makes them useful comparative material for contextualizing the three data deficient species. In order to analyze all this morphological data and compare and contrast the three data deficient SWIO species the four northern Indian Ocean species, I first performed a principal component analysis. A PCA is a multivariate statistic where all variables are condensed into what are called principal components. These are then projected onto two axes or a 2D plot because our brains would have a very difficult time comprehending a, in my case, 63 dimensional plot. So I performed a PCA on the percent total length of all morphological characters for our seven Indian Ocean rhinobatus species. So that's our three data deficient SWIO species and then the four comparative material species. I also performed a linear discriminant analysis or an LDA. An LDA is another multivariate statistic that is very similar to a PCA and that all variables get to get condensed into discriminant functions. An LDA differs, however, in that it attempts to maximize the separation between classes, or in this case, species which are defined ahead of time. In short terms, a PCA will just try and group similar data to points together without taking into account what category you've placed them in. An LDA 
will try to group similar points or individuals together while trying to maximize the separation between those groups. I ran two main versions of the LDA, which I will clarify in a second. One on the percent total length of all morphological characters used to distinguish guitar fishes, and one on the percent total length of the 12 characters related to nasal morphology, which is labeled on the figure on the right. This follows something that was done on the pseudobatus, or the amphiamerican guitar fishes, by Rutledge in 2019, which found that nasal morphology could be used to distinguish species of pseudobatus. And the reason I said main versions is because I also broke this nasal morphology LDA down further into one iteration on all our seven Indian Ocean rhinobatus and another on just the three Swayo rhinobatus. I then performed what's considered a more traditional morphological analysis by looking at the percent total length of each character, which you'll see abbreviated as percent TL. This is done by taking the length of each morphological character, dividing it by the total length, and multiplying by 100. This allowed me to compare the proportional sizes of these morphological characters, making it easier to look at variation within and between species. In other words, this reduces the effect of varying total lengths, you know, the bigger the fish, the bigger the fin, um, and allowed me to see if one species maybe had a proportionally shorter snout than another, or if the distance between the dorsal fins was proportionally similar between all three species. This traditional analysis also included looking at meristics, which are quantitative features that can be counted. So for guitar fishes, this includes the number of nasal lamellae, which you can hopefully see them. They kind of just like run all the way through the nostril here. They might just look like lines. Um, and as well as vertebral and fin radial counts, which are taken from radiographs. And you can see an example of a radiograph on the right there where I highlighted 20 vertebra in green, as well as the pectoral and pelvic fins in yellow. So pectoral fin, pelvic fin. This analysis also included looking at dorsal surface features. So just to summarize my methods and what the goal of each approach was, the statistical analyses, the PCA and LDA, were performed to contextualize and compare the three Swayo rhinobatus to the other Indian Ocean rhinobatus in multivariate space, do the three Swayo species overlap, and how do they com behave compared to the other Indian Ocean rhinobatus. The statistical analyses also allowed me to see which morphological characters drive separation between species, or which traits can you primarily use to distinguish guitar fishes. The traditional analysis was then done to compare the Swayo species to each other, and morphometrics not evaluated by the statistics, such as meristics, and see which traits were different between species. And finally, I compared which morphological traits were important in the statistical analyses to which traits were distinct in the traditional analyses to see if they were similar or not. So since there are a lot of results to discuss, here's a mini roadmap for you. So we'll start by looking at the results of the statistical analyses, the PCA, the LDA, and then the nasal LDA. And these sections will be denoted by a little scatter plot symbol that will then go in the top left corner next to the banner. Then we'll look at the results of the traditional morphological analysis, the percent total length of characters, and meristics, which will be den denoted by this tape measure looking symbol. This will also go in the top left corner. And finally, we'll compare the results of the two analysis types and see which morphological characters were important in both. And this section will be denoted by the scatter plot slash measuring tape symbol. So starting with the PCA, there's a lot going on here, but before we dive into it, some things to note. First, the key to each species is on the right, and they're all in alphabetical order. So Anandalii is represented by a dark teal square, Austini an orange diamond, et cetera. Um, punctifer may be a bit difficult for you to see. It's these gray bullseye symbols, so I just wanted to point that out. Um, and these same colors will be used for each species throughout this whole section. And since I just threw seven scientific names at you, um, our three data deficient SWIO species, our target species, 
are all indicated by a star. So overall, in this figure, there's some separation between species and some clustering within species. Anandalii, in particular, forms this nice cluster over here. And then there's a little bit of overlap for all the other species, just the mosh pit looking thing over here. However, given the morphological similarities of these species and guitar fishes in general, this is kind of to be expected and you can still see some separation if you break it down. So I've circled Nuna dorsalis, Lyonotis, and Ranagensis, and you can see that there is some distinction. And perhaps the most important aspect of this PCA, which as a reminder, does not factor in what species each individual point is assigned to, is that our three SWIO species do not overlap, which is great and a promising indicator that these species are distinct. So now, what is driving the separation and clustering we see here? Enter the vector plot. So the PCA with our species is on the left now, and a vector plot for the greatest loadings for the principal components is on the right. And if you have no idea what that means, don't worry. So the, when I say greatest loadings, these characters had the longest arrows and greatest absolute values for PC1, our x-axis, and PC2, our y-axis. What that means is there are 55 other arrows that you do not see on this vector plot because their importance or weight in creating that plot on the left is increasingly less than the characters you see here. And you can also imagine that the vector plot could be kind of overlaid over the top of the plot on the left. So what do we see presented here? These characters are generally related to body size, fin morphology, and mouth width, which is also one of the longest arrows and the character we'll start with. This arrow is pointing to the left and down a little bit, which is where that Anandalii cluster is. Anandalii had the widest mouth width, while in the opposite direction of that arrow, Neuter dorsalis had the narrowest mouth width. And here's a box plot of the percent total length of mouth width, mouth width for each of these species to kind of help you visualize the difference between them. And you can see that the mouth width for Anandalii is quite a bit wider than that for Neuter dorsalis. So now if we choose a different arrow, like first dorsal fin height, this arrow is pointing a little to the right, but mostly down. In this general direction, we have the punctifer individuals, which also had the tallest dorsal fin, and in the opposite direction, Ranagensis had the shortest first dorsal fin. And here's another box plot to help visualize the difference between these two species. And you can again see that the first dorsal fin height for punctifer is a bit larger than that for Ranagensis. So hopefully you're starting to see how to kind of read these plots and how the differences for each character kind of get pieced together to create a PCA plot. So just to summarize before we continue, we've got decent separation and clustering here. The three SWIO don't overlap, and PC1 and PC2 primarily loaded with characters related to body size, first dorsal fin morphology, and mouth width. Moving on to the linear discriminant analysis, we have some beautiful separation and clustering here. But unlike the PCA, and LDA does factor in which species each individual is assigned to, so it makes sense that the separation between each species is much greater in this plot. You'll notice that all three Swio renovatus are over here, and given the high morphological similarity of these three particular species, this is kind of unsurprising. So now, what morphological characters are driving what we see here? Looking at the vector plot for the LDA, these characters are a bit different from the ones that loaded into the PCA. These characters are mostly related to body size with one fin morphology character and one nasal character. And this plot can be interpreted the exact same way as the PCA vector plot, so we're not gonna break it down <laughs> into as much detail as we did for the PCA. But I did want to draw your attention to posterior nasal flap width because this starts to get at why the Austini and Holcorhynchus clusters are so close in this plot. So you can see how similar the widths of the posterior nasal flap for Holcorhynchus and Austini are while seeing the difference between those two species and Ranagensis, 
which had the narrowest posterior nasal flap. Now, you may remember that I also ran an LDA on just the 12 characters related to nasal morphology. So here it is. And once again, we have some really nice separation and clustering here. There's a tiny bit of overlap between Lyonotis and Ranongensis, our uh, purple and pink triangle. But again, the Swayo species generally wind up together over here, and then the other four, Indian Ocean Rhinobatus, are over here. Also in this plot, Austini and Holcorhynchus are much further apart. If we look at the vector loading plot, there's posterior nasal flap width again, which based on the size of the arrow, seems to be driving a lot of the separation here. Nostril length also has a pretty long arrow. We'll look into this character a little bit before we move on, because this arrow is pointing almost directly to Holcorhynchus. So I've circled Holcorhynchus in green, Austini in orange, and Lyonotis in pink. And here's the box plot of the percent total length for Holcorhynchus, Austini, and Lyonotis. We start to see a little more of a difference between Holcorhynchus and Austini, and the difference between these two species and some of the other Indian Ocean rhinobatus. Since this LDA performed on the 12 nasal characters, did even better at separating the three Swayo species, let's take a closer look at just those three. So here's the LDA performed on the nasal characters for just the three Swayo species, and there's, unsurprisingly, even more clustering and separation here as the LDA works its magic. And if we quickly, quickly I promise, look at which characters are driving the separation, we see nostril length and posterior nasal flap width again. And as we saw in the previous box plots, Austini and Holcorhynchus had longer nostrils and wider posterior nasal flaps than Neutrodorsalis, while Neutrodorsalis generally had the longest anterior nasal flap base length and posterior lateral flap total length, say that five times fast, and internarial distance. Okay, so we kind of blazed through the LDAs, so we'll take a moment here. For the most part, there's pretty good separation in both. The Swayo species generally group together, while the other four Rhinobatus also generally group together. The Austini and Holcorhynchus clusters are a bit close in the LDA performed on all morphological characters, but this is mostly due to just how similar these species are, which you will see more of in a moment. But importantly, they don't overlap and they separate even further in the LDA performed on the 12 nasal characters. In both of these LDAs, posterior nasal flap width primarily loaded into either LD1 or LD2. For the nasal LDAs, nostril length and posterior nasal flap width primarily loaded into both, and nasal morphology appears to be a pretty decent way to tell the three Swayo species apart. So now that we've had enough of stats, we'll look at the results of the traditional morphological analysis. And as a reminder, this includes comparing the percent total length of characters and meristics, and was only performed on the three Swayo rhinobatus since the comparative material species were just revised in 2019. So we'll start with percent total length, and since both Austini and neuter dorsalis have been misidentified as Holcorhynchus, but not as each other because of when and how they were described, we'll compare Austini to Holcorhynchus, and then Holcorhynchus to neuter dorsalis. Starting with Austini, there were six morphological characters where there was a distinct difference between Austini and Holcorhynchus. There were two characters where Austini was proportionally bigger than Holcorhynchus, body depth at second dorsal fin origin, and second dorsal fin base length. These are more box plots of the percent total length for each species, Austini, orange on the left, Holcorhynchus, green on the right. And there were four characters where Austini was smaller than Holcorhynchus, pre-socket snout length, snout to pelvic fin origin, as well as orbit and spherical length and distance across anterior nasal apertures. This isn't very many characters, which also helps explain why Austini and Holcorhynchus were so close together in that LDA performed on all the rhinobatus. Moving on to Holcorhynchus versus Neutrodorsalis, 
there were 15 characters that were distinctly different between the two species. So in these box plots, Hulkerinkus, green on the left, Nur dorsalis, turquoise on the right, and I promise I am not going to show you all 15 box plots. We'll just take a peek at a handful. So here were the characters where Hulkerinkus was bigger than Nudor dorsalis, snout to anterior vent, and orbit in spherical length. As well as mouth width and distance between fifth gill openings. These differences are pretty substantial, which also helps explain why Nudor dorsalis was often well separated from Austini and Hulkerinkus in the statistics. Interestingly, there were no characters where Hulkerinkus was distinctly smaller than Nudor dorsalis. So, there were a few characters where there was a difference between both Austini and Hulkerinkus, and then Hulkerinkus and Neuter dorsalis. Were there any characters that were distinctly different between all three species? No, but that's okay. There are still several characters that can be used to distinguish Hulkerinkus from Austini and Hulkerinkus from Neuter dorsalis. Snout to pelvic fin origin, orbit and spherical length, and distance across anterior nasal apertures. There is some overlap between Austini and Neuter dorsalis for these features, but like I said, these two species haven't really been misidentified as each other because the ambiguity of Hulkerinkus is the real problem. And there are several characters that I haven't shown here that are very different between Austini and Neuter dorsalis. So now we'll move on to neuristics and start with the nasal lamellae counts. And this will also be the last close up of nostrils I will make you look at. <laughs> So Hulkerinkus had the greatest number of nasal lamellae, and Neuter dorsalis had the least, with no overlap between any of these species. As a bonus, the differences in these nasal lamellae counts is greater than the differences between most other rhinobatus, including our four comparative material species. This is particularly great because nasal lamellae counts do not require any specialized training. You just look in the nostril and count them. They also don't require the individual to be intact, which could be super helpful in identifying individuals at fish markets. Continuing on with meristics, there are seven different categories of vertebral counts for guitar fishes. I'm just going to give you an overview of two of them because vertebral counts aren't really the most diagnostic metric because it requires getting a radiograph. You can't really just like radiograph a fish on a boat, doesn't really work. Um, but I told you we'd look at some radiographs, so here they are, and it can be helpful to know. So these are the total vertebral segment counts. So every vertebra, so from up here all the way down, and the post synarchural vertebra, which is from, hopefully I can do this accurately, this point down, so it excludes the vertebra that are up here. And there are some slight differences in the counts between these species, the more you know. Also from radiographs, I counted fin radials. Again, there are four categories of fin radial counts, and since these also require radiographs, I'll just give you a summary of the pectoral and pelvic fin radials. And there are some slight differences between species, and it was interesting that Neuter dorsalis didn't have a range in radial counts, and I promise I recounted them multiple times because I was like, there's, there's no way. Like, how is this possible? There is a way, somehow. And there are also very distinct differences in the dorsal surfaces of these species. So fun fact, guitar fishes can have thorns, and only the male ostini had thorns along the mid-back and between the dorsal fins, and they weren't particularly large. Female ostini do not have any thorns but both sexes have dermal denticle patches, which basically means that if you were to run your hand along their dorsal surface, you would feel kind of like little, little prickly things. Both sexes of Hulkerinkus have pretty prominent thorns along the mid-back between the dorsal fins and between the second dorsal fin and the caudal fin. So hopefully you can see them a little better in this close-up. If it just kind of looks like a white line in the middle under the arrow, that's like the light reflecting off of the bottom of the thorn. And Neuter dorsalis doesn't have any thorns at all. And this is where it gets its common name, the bareback guitar fish from. It also doesn't even really have the dermal denticle patches that most guitar fishes have and is pretty smooth to the touch. 
So dorsal surface thorns and denticle patches may be another really good way to distinguish these species. So in summary, nasal lamellae, pretty distinct, super distinct, um, and potentially useful out in the field. Vertebral counts and fin radials, somewhat distinct, but also not the most useful metrics for distinguishing species while out and about. Dorsal surface thorns and denticles, also great, and could be super useful identifying species out in the field. So now, we'll compare the results of the statistical analysis to the results of the traditional analysis. And as a reminder from the traditional analysis, distinct between two species means there was no overlap in the percent total length between those species. So for example, there was a distinct difference in the orbit and spherical length between Austini and Holcorhynchus, and then a distinct difference between Holcorhynchus and Neuterdorsalis. But there was not a distinct difference between Austini and Neuterdorsalis. And I also wanted to give you the heads up that because the two nasal LDAs were pretty similar, and for the sake of time, um, I won't be comparing the results of the nasal LDA performed on the three swio rhinobatus to the traditional analysis. So we'll start with the PCA. Here's a table of the characters that primarily loaded into the PCA, so the characters that were in our vector plots, and those are in the PCA loadings column, as well as the minimum and maximum percent total length for each character, or the range of sizes, from the traditional analysis for Austini in orange, Holgerinchus in green, and Neuterdorsalis in blue. And our match column, the column all the way to the left, will be filled in based on whether, in addition to primarily loading into the PCA, it was distinct between two species in the traditional analysis. So a green check mark means the character was distinct in the traditional analysis, so there is a match with the PCA. And a red X means it was not, so there is no match. So ventral head length, snout length pre-socket, and mouth width were all distinct between two of the swio species and loaded into either PC1 or PC2. I'll let you all absorb that for a moment. Moving on to the LDA, here are the characters that primarily loaded into either LD1 or LD2, as well as the minimum and maximum sizes of each character for our three SWIO species. So the exact same table, but with our vector plot loadings from the LDA. And here are which characters were distinct in the morphological analysis. Um, we have a new symbol, this yellow dash next to body depth maximum, and that's because technically there's a difference between Austinine and Holcorhynchus, but it's literally 0.01%. Um, which felt a little, I didn't feel great about putting a green check mark next to that. Anyway, since there was only a distinct difference between one of these characters, this may help explain why the three SWIO species were all over here and why Austini and Holcorhynchus were so close together. Because we saw this when we went into the LDA in depth, the posterior nasal flap width for Austini and Holcorhynchus is super similar, but then it is distinct between Holcorhynchus and Neuterdorsalis. Finally, onto our nasal LDA. Here are the characters that are primarily loaded into either LD1 or LD2, and the minimum and maximum sizes of each character for our three SWIO species. And here are which characters were distinct in the traditional analysis. It's most of them which helps explain why the separation between species is even greater here. And if we look at the box plots, they're beautiful. And this is cool because several of these characters align with those that have been used to distinguish other species of guitar fish in other traditional morphological studies. Nostril length has been used to distinguish Ranengensis, one of our comparative material species, to, from Jimborensis, which is found in the Indo-Pacific. Distance across anterior nasal apertures has also been used to distinguish two of our comparative material species, Ranengensis from punctifer, and then in the pseudobatus, or the amphi-American guitar fishes, nostril length and posterior nasal flap width have been used to distinguish pseudobatus leucorhynchus from pseudobatus reductus. 
So overall, this is a promising indicator that these characters are pretty informative for distinguishing guitar fishes. So after all of that, I've hopefully convinced you that although they are similar, these species are valid and distinct. They were separate in statistical analyses, and in multivariate space, they behaved similarly to the other Indian Ocean rhinobatus. There were also a variety of morphometric characters that were distinct between these species, including unique nasal lamella count and dorsal surface features. Nasal morphology also appears to be a good way to distinguish these species, which matches what Rutledge 2019 found for the pseudobatus. All this information, and then some, has been compiled into revised descriptions for Austini, Holcorhynchus, and Neuterdorsalis. Okay, so, although these redescriptions are a huge improvement over the current descriptions, a coordinated effort is still required to collect more material across a range of sizes and sexes for these species. More specifically, additional males of Austini sexually mature individuals of Holcorhynchus and non-gravid or non-pregnant females of Neuterdorsalis are needed to clarify instances of sexual dimorphism and ontogenetic variability, which is changes in morphology throughout an organism's lifetime. This has been reported for a few other species of Rhinobatus, but is generally poorly understood in this genus. There are a few characters in my traditional analysis where there appeared to be some sexual dimorphism but since I only had one male austini, one female neuter dorsalis, more material is really needed to clarify those differences. I also just wanted to say that on this slide, the color differences between the female and the male are entirely due to preservation and not at all what you would see in real life. I guess not real life, in fresh specimens? Yeah, there we go. More material from across the geographic ranges of these species would also help us clarify where the geographic overlap for Austini and Holcorhynchus actually is, and whether or not Neuterdorsalis is endemic to the Mascarene Ridge. This would also aid in clarifying the habitats each species occupies, which would be helpful in implementing fisheries management strategies, since different fisheries target different habitats. Holcorhynchus appears to occur more offshore and at deeper depths than Austini, so clarifying the upper and lower limits of their depth ranges would also help in applying the proper fishing and management strategies to each species. These redescriptions do provide a lot of firsts for these species, including the first full description of Holcorhynchus, which includes the first description of the chondrocranium, which I have circled in blue, as well as the first female for Neuterdorsalis and the first male for Austini. These redescriptions clarify the taxonomic status of these species and improve our ability to identify them, especially relative to one another. These redescriptions not only describe some of the more apparent differences, but also some of the more minute yet distinguishing characteristics of each species. This also lays the taxonomic foundation for life history studies. So now that we can identify these species, we can de determine some of the basic life history characteristics that are presently unknown, including size and age at maturity and how often they reproduce. So going out and gathering some of the same data that we now have for species like the large-toothed sawfish. This would also increase our confidence in identifications for future molecular studies. So here's a snippet of an entry from the BOLD database or the Barcode of Life database, and this individual is just identified as Rhinobatus sp. And it's from near Durban, South Africa, so whether it's Austini or Holcorhynchus is a bit of a toss-up, um, but it was caught from shore, so maybe an Austini. Anywho, the individual that sequence came from has allegedly been deposited at the South African Institute of Aquatic Biodiversity, or SIAB. So in theory, we could go over there and <laughs> identify it, and then have a really, and then have a sequence that could be used in downstream molecular studies, such as phylogenetic analysis, or even a population genetic study, neither of which has really been done for these species. These redescriptions are also timely, since red list assessments are required to be updated every 10 years, and these species were last assessed in 2018. This is important 
because in the first global assessment of chondrichthyan species, so all our cartilaginous fish friends, in 2014, 24% were threatened with extinction, and in less than a decade, this number has jumped to almost 33%. Between these two global assessments, several species that were data deficient were reassessed by the IUCN, including one of our comparative material species, Rhinobeta sanandalii. So Rhinobeta sanandalii was data deficient for a while there, and after its redescription in 2019, Anandalii was subsequently reassessed as critically endangered. A similar situation may become apparent for the three swile rhinobetas. They may be endangered and we just don't know it yet. Highlighting the urgent need to further study these species so they can be assessed by the IUCN. Once these species are assessed, we can work with the communities where these species are found to develop the proper management strategies to ensure these communities both have enough food and income, and that these species are around for future generations. Finally, this thesis is the culmination of a multi-year international effort. So I have to say thank you so much to all of these individuals listed here that assisted with data collection, as well as the funding organizations that have made this project possible. And finally, to my thesis committee as a whole, um, thank you all for being so flexible and supportive, especially in COVID. Um, Dave, thank you for sharing your expertise and for the variety of professional experiences with AES and everything that I just like never thought I would get. Being on a podcast is pretty cool, so thank you. Um, Scott, I really enjoyed the classes I got to take with you. Um, I've learned a lot from you and I'm pretty sure I still have most of the fish families memorized from ichthyology, which makes me super fun to go to the aquarium with. Um, <laughs> Amanda, I've also just had so much fun in your classes. Um, your energy is absolutely contagious and just makes me want to learn about everything from sponges to all the molecular things, so thank you. Um, to the other faculty and staff at Moss, especially those I've had the opportunity to take a class with, thank you. I've learned a lot from so many of you. And to the other students at Moss, thank you for the laughs and for being just awesome classmates. Especially shout out to my fellow COVID cohorts. Thanks for getting us all through it. Um, I also have to thank the Into Career staff, Debbie and Laura, for letting me work remotely before it was even cool. Um, they have just created the most flexible and supportive work environment of all time. Loved working for you guys. Um, I appreciate you so much, and to my friends and family, thank you for listening to me blather on about guitarfish, um, <laughs> providing me with feedback, and for supporting me on this journey to end. And thank you again to everyone here, whether you're here in person or virtually on the Zoom or on the live stream. And as a final parting fun fact, Rhinobatus Austini has made an appearance on Shark Week. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Throw it out there. You mentioned about you may need to go to South Africa. Yeah. You say, would you like to do that before or after we sign your thesis? Could have her wait another year, maybe? Uh, how about after? I think after would be good. Well, we'll talk about it later. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. a later problem. Yeah. Uh, any questions? I know I threw a lot at you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so kind of more like a, um, have I done a like holistic, like, okay, like if I have just the head, like the whole, everything that's going into what the head looks like, like is this different between yeah, the species? Yeah, like the nostrils, the, 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 there are a lot of like stuff in here, the spatial decline that were really important, so I think it's yeah. a shape analysis might be a really interesting way to look at 
Yeah, right now it's mostly like um, like in, didn't see the whole thing here, but there is a lot of in like the written description, like comparing like the width of the nasal flap to the length of the nasal flap and like how that's different in each species, but a more like holistic, like now the head of this one is literally rounder than the other ones would be a really interesting and probably useful thing to look at. So that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's something that's like one of those that's kind of understood for a few species. And as we get more material and are starting to see more, there are definitely differences. Like the females are, have like kind of like squatter faces <laughs> than the males do and things like that. Thanks. Yeah, Scott. Yeah, so since they're flat sharks um, and they're kind of like compressed on the bottom, they're mainly, you know, bottom feeders. So we're swimming around. This actually looks a lot like a guitar fish, you know, swimming around and they'll smell or whatever is in the seafloor and the sand or whatever. And they'll kind of just like do the little smash their face <laughs> into the ground with their mouth to try and get it. Um, so that kind of like flattened every their na you know their nose is on the bottom they're smelling things on the bottom um, is definitely attributed to their diet and ecology but the specifics of the diet for each species is pretty pretty unknown at this point but generally bottom feeders finding things in the sand okay Yeah, so um, Naylor et al. in 2012, it's, it's a book, <laughs> there's a book, um, where they have a scattering of sequences from guitar fishes, the giant guitar fishes, the wedges, and made a giant, oh, thank you, a giant tree um, of, for those species. Um, for my species, none of the ones I looked at have, you know, sequences, which is kind of part of the problem. Um, so if we go to Africa, <laughs> And ID that one, we can use that one for some molecular analysis. Oh, okay. About that is that the, uh, the neutered orsalis do have sequences. Oh, cool. And the only reason they were done is because they, because they, uh, Gavin Naylor thought they were Holcorhynchus. Oh. They turned out oh, to be. Go. So that's the only one that has any, it's been sequenced at all. And that was on the new material she looked at, but because she wasn't in the field to get it, it she wasn't aware of that, so. Do you have other questions, man? Okay, I'm taking it. All right. Um, the other one was thinking about the, uh, I loved the comparisons that you did between the traditional morphological measurements and your LDA and your PCA. And for the nasal LDA versus the traditional, I'm curious about the one that didn't line up. So why do you think that the LDA discriminated something? I wrote it down. Distance from nostril to the disc margin. Like why would that affect oh. an LDA but not be something that you identified? Did you go back to the morphology to ask whether you had missed something or what your thoughts are? This one? Yeah. Nostril, disc margin. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I did go back because I was like, why is it just this one? <laughs> like why? why? Um, and it's just, I mean, you can see it in the, um, I should use pointer pointer. You know, you can see it in these numbers. They're like, it, it's just like a mishmash for each of these species. They're all, one of them is like maybe a little bit bigger than the other one, and the other one's like maybe a little bit smaller than the other one, but then one of them is just like perfectly in the middle of both of them, so it's like, 
yeah, it doesn't help like distinguish those three in particular, but for the other guitar fishes, my other like Indian Ocean Rhinobatus, it did, which oh, is why it was, yeah, which is why I loaded. Got it, yeah. okay, so this was from your seventh? Yes, okay. yeah, this is the seventh one, yes, cool. yeah. Okay. okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Anyone else? Anyone else have any questions? Um, so when you were talking about the nasal lamellae, I thought I knew what you were talking about, and then you said that there were like 60 of them. Yeah. How tiny are they? Could that be like an easily identifiable if you're on a boat, or is that like you need to anesthetize or take it back and then like microscope look in there later? Yeah, so ideally, you know, the boat isn't rocking too much and you have a fish that's cooperating with you. So like perfect world scenario, you know, you have the fish on the boat with you and you just like, like hold still and like you know you're just like counting they're super small um so i guess it's more relevant if you're at a fish market where you know the specimen's already deceased um, so it's not moving and you just have that part and then you can like pull like really pull the nostril flaps back and be like okay one two three all the way up to you know however many of them are in each species yeah thanks yeah thank you just making sure i don't have any questions is it oh thank you everyone hi everyone <laughs> no, they're just. No, oh, okay. Do we have any other questions? And one thing I could add to your to a comment I think Scott had about the ecology and the difference in the yeah. nasal lamellae is that you touched on it in your in your presentation, but they have each of these have very distinct habitats that they live in, and so some of these things could be related to that. But this yeah. gets into a whole yeah. lot more needs to be done, but. Identifying what they are first is important, which she's done now. But that could have some, now we know what, how to identify them. We know they have some different habitats. Yeah. We can start to look at the more of their ecology. Yeah. Oh, I knew you'd get Amanda. That makes me think of one more, actually, which is yeah. if you're in a fish market, I could see staring at their faces and their noses. But if you're looking at ROV videos where you might see their ecology or something, mm -hmm. what would you use as, or like Shark Week, and you see these guys swim by, what would you use and recommend as the characters for people to look for? Like, could you make a video field identification guide That's for swios? Um, yeah, because you can't, you can't just be like, hi, can you flip over for the camera, please? Um, the yeah, the color pattern is pretty different between them. For guitar fishes in general, color pattern isn't necessarily a the most reliable thing because there's changes in spots between juveniles and adults and then between species like you can have like pseudobatus can be like completely plain or have some spots so being like the one with the spots is definitely an austin eye is like i mean probably but like eh. um, which is kind of why now that we can identify them better describing those dorsal patterns and whatnot and seeing like okay like Maybe Hulkerinchus can have some spots, but it's way fewer than what you would expect from an austeni. And then neuter dorsalis just looks like very naked. You know, like it's like entirely smooth. You can't see any thorns, which maybe if your ROV is like right up next to it, you could see some thorns or something. Um, so yeah, probably dorsal coloration. Cool. And so maybe you would do something like a nudie dorsalis possibly could be identified, or you'd have an austeni Hulkerinchus complex and just say yeah. that's. As far yeah. as you can go from video? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool, cool. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, any other final questions? Anybody there? No? Uh, no questions in the chat. <laughs> well, if there's no more questions, I'm done. Yeah. Almost. I'm done. Almost. <laughs> Almost. We got The committee has to go interrogate her for a few minutes um, afterwards, but uh, otherwise, Thank you, everyone, for coming to yeah. Thesis Defense. Um, and if you are here in person, there are, there are snacks, there is food, there are beverages of choice.